Hey everybody, welcome to this free edition of our Trade to Use Group Weekly Roundup. This is for the trading week ending December 4th, 2020. I'm Preston Brenton. Thanks for tuning in. Remember, don't be a rat brain trader. You want to be the red stripe zebra. And this week's theme is wash, rinse, and repeat. As many times as you think things will change, they never do. People, human nature, behavioral economics, it's always the same thing. But before we get into any of that, let's go take a look at how we did this past week. So let's just kind of walk through some of the data and some of the performance and just see where things were going. If we look, take a look at the uh, Dow, you can see that the Dow, S&P, NASDAQ, Russell all finished in the green for the week. Year to date, everybody's in the green. Look at the Russell up 11.84% and almost 80% of the gain in the Russell for the year happened in the month of November. November was a very strong month, not only for the Russell, but for the Dow, S&P. It's up 14.5% for the year. For the month of November, it was up strong. It was like back almost about 70% of the gain for the year for the S&P in just one four-week period. NASDAQ's up just under 40% for the year. Okay, And if we look at the sector performance, you can see energy again is finishing really strong with a positive outcome with an OPEC meeting this past week. It was up for the week 4.27. The worst sector is uh, utilities bringing up the rear 2.12. And you can see the annual performance. Obviously, technology has been leading the way almost all year long. It's up 38.90% energy bringing up the rear 28.78. But energy is up off the 50% lows for the year. It's just been having a pretty good little comeback uh, as of late. And look at the P.E. ratios. You can see the Ford P.E. ratio in the upper right-hand corner of the uh, screen there, 25.97. So that's fairly high valuation. It's lower than the trailing by about 37%, a little almost 38% actually, primarily because of the crash in March and April time frame, primarily March for the COVID. You can see the dividend yield for the S&Ps at 165 Ten-year Treasury is just slightly under 1% at 96.9 basis points. So that makes the spread between the two a little bit tighter. 68.1 basis points is the spread. Remember, as that spread gets tighter and tighter, it puts more money into the Treasury market from equities. But right now, we've got a very strong flow into the equity markets. Um, and you can see the current VIX was almost flat for the entire week. It's still holding above 20. Last week, it closed at 20.84, and this prior week, this past Friday, closed at 20.79, so almost a 0% move percentage-wise. And then, of course, if we take a look at um, you know the major markets around the planet, you can see the only one in the red for the week was the DAX coming underwater about 28 basis points, so practically flat. The rest of the markets were up. The FTSE was up, CAC 40. Nikkei, China, Hang Seng, all up. Year to date, three markets in the green. The DAX just barely 38 basis points, so essentially flat for the year. But then the Nikkei, you know, just a record performance in the Nikkei, multi-decade highs, you know, almost three-decade high. And the Nikkei performance is up this year, 13.08%. And then China also having a very strong year at 12.93%. So, um, Still, we've got strong momentum going into the markets. And if we just kind of take over and just take a look at some weekly sound bites here, we'll start with the market index performance. As I said, all stocks reached into all time high record territory. Well, not all stocks, but most of the major indexes did, you know, touching new intraday highs uh, this past Friday. Um, the, and we kind of kicked off last week with the Dow. Uh, closed uh, where it closed out the month of November. It was the best monthly November performance going all the way back to 1987. That four-week move in the Dow is what moved it up uh, year-to-date as strong as it did, right? I mean, we're in the green year-to-date for the Dow. It moved it up um, uh, year-to-date 5.89%, really strong. Uh, but meanwhile, you thought the Dow was strong, the Russell. The small cap Russell 2000 had its best monthly gain since the inception of the Russell index. Since that goes all the way back to 1978, it just this where almost all the gains were made in the Russell for this year. Really amazing. Okay, now traditionally the last half of November and all of December is the strongest month for all indexes, and of all indexes, the Russell tends to be the strongest. 
Well, we're clearly seeing that, you know. Now, we do have um, also in this week, we got rising hopes of a COVID vaccine. Um, and paradoxically, um, the new round of fiscal stimulus appears to be boosting market sentiment on economic data that didn't quite come in that good. I'll talk about that in just one second. And then we got finally rounding out the uh, index performance was the, we did see the Atlanta Federal Reserve's model for predicting GDP. They call it their GDP now. It's predicting a annualized growth for Q4 of 11.1% for Q4 GDP which is strong from just a month ago when it was saying 2.2%, okay? So we're seeing money react to all of this news. Now, if we do look at it, you can see, I did mention the economic data <coughs> appears to be stalling just a little bit on the economic data front. Um, <clears throat> we did see stocks rise on Friday after a non-farm uh, payroll coming in missing consist uh, consensus estimates by almost half came in rising only 245,000. <coughs> they were expecting over a half a million. But that kind of pushed, as I said earlier, paradoxically, uh, it supported uh, prices by bolstering the hopes of a fiscal stimulus. And we are getting Pelosi backing off of her $2 trillion treasury demand, um, uh, demand that they, we spend $2 trillion. And McConnell is uh, coming up just a little bit, but not much. So I suspect before these blowhards in D.C. take a holiday break. They're going to come to some uh, agreement. And I think it's going to happen in the next two weeks. It's going to be pretty quick. We did see the unemployment rate fall to a pandemic low of 6.7%. Some of that was due to uh, a drop in the labor force participation rate. Many people staying home, you know, perhaps with the rise in COVID cases, <coughs> hospitalization rates and things like that. <coughs> but we're seeing also manufacturing sector coming in pretty good, right? The ISM gauge factory activity posted in November its first month over month decline. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we're also seeing the uh, signs of cooling in the housing sector also still in positive territory. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me freeze my... Uh, uh, my audio for just one second and get a little bit of a drink of water here. Hang on just one sec. Okay, that should be a little bit better. I had something I swallowed the wrong way. So we're getting some of this economic data. It shows that it's cooling just a little bit, but still in the positive sign, right? So it's going to be really interesting, although I still see momentum coming up, as I've told you guys, and I'm showing my members. We're going to get, um, you know, I'm just the charts are saying we should run up to about 3,800 before the end of January, and then we're going to have a pretty good little pullback. Now, it may happen sooner, but I do see some more continuing momentum. And I was telling our members, um, just to watch 3,700, we'll probably run up and tap it, which we did uh, on Friday, right? Now, if we look at uh, the Treasury market and just kind of see what's going on in U.S. Treasuries, longer-term yields um, climbed through much of the week, basically being fueled by optimism, optimism of a fiscal stimulus deal, right? Remember, the Feds are buying on the front end of the curve, not the back end, so um, – uh, longer term yields uh, going higher while the short term two years staying relatively flat increased the uh, yield curve to its widest level we've seen since early 2018. So that helps financials um, pretty good a little bit right now. Of course, if we look on the um, Brexit front, you know, good news, bad news, good news, bad news. I mean, it's just like toilet paper stuck to the bottom of your shoe. It hadn't gone away. Uh, and these politicians over there between the UK, UK and the EU, they just can't figure it out. You know, hopes of a they would strike a deal this weekend uh, is really fading as disagreements are uh, con uh, persisting, I guess, on, on stuff like fishing rights, state aid. I mean, it's just little things like this. Negotiators are going to try and finalize the deal before the EU leaders summit next week. But I'm not raising my hopes up. All right. We'll see what happens. Um, on Thursday of this past week, the French minister from Europe 
warned in an in interview that he did on radio that France would veto a deal that did not align with French interests. But you know what? It's like herding cats. The EU is like about 20 some odd countries, each with their own interest, each with, you know, possible veto power. So, you know, that's what happens when you just kind of run everything as a multi-headed snake. You just, you know, and you end up biting yourself and it's just stupid. So I suspect Boris Bulldog Johnson's going to have to take some tough action and just pull the plug or force some issues and be done with it. Because if you guys remember, they voted on this Brexit deal and. 2016, July 2016. Really crazy. Meanwhile, with all the COVID cases rising, all the problems over in Europe, over here in the U.S., and lockdowns increasing, cooling economy, we got China, which has had their third straight weekly gain, as I just mentioned, um, aided by solid economic data. I mean, on their economic front, they've had their official manufacturing PMI rose to 52.1. Remember, anything over 50 is a positive uh, expansion. So We've seen that come up uh, from um, uh, October's PMI. It's ninth straight month of staying in expansionary territory for their PMIs. Um, so it's just, it's really very strong. Uh, and we're getting their services PMI. It's the strongest reading that we've seen since June. It was in at 57.8. So China is looking very strong as well. Now, what I want to do is shift you over and just show you a couple of these charts and then just show you some of the rotation um, that that I've talked about that's happening underneath the uh, the trading action underneath the surface of the water here. So let me just switch the screen over. Uh, let's get it over here like this. Where are we? Here we go right here. Uh, and what you're going to see, the first thing you're going to see is the E-mini S&P 500 futures. And you're going to see I got a couple of colored bars on the screen. These are my targets for the E-minis. Um, over the next four to six weeks, you can see here, we've almost hit my initial target around all the way up to 3750. You can came, you can see here that we hit 3700 even, and then the uh, algos just, you know, backed it off just a little bit. Wouldn't be surprised to see it come back down to the 3600 level and then make another run and then run up to, you know, anywhere from 3750 to 3800 before the end of January. But this looks just like January 2018. December and January of 2018, where we had a huge momentum push, um, just an uh, uh, unbelievable move higher. And I remember market participants were saying that we're just getting too overvalued, but they kept jumping in. And then in February, we had the highest pop in volatility in the history of the markets up until that time, right? And VIX just went crazy. And we had about a almost a 15% pullback, 12 and a half, 13% pullback in February going into March of 2018 okay so I mean I'm seeing a lot of the similar signs here in the same thing right now with the MACD it suggests any pullbacks are going to be bought on the dip now of course if we look at emerging markets uh, let me just pull that up on the screen you can see here a lot of money's going into emerging markets you can see we also made a new 2020 high at 50.88 on the um, ETF that tracks emerging markets, EEM. You can see the 2019 closing price, so we're up nicely on that. And of course, if we look at the tracking stock for China, Asher, you can see here uh, we made new highs on Friday as well. Uh, and China is just doing very, very strong in the markets. And then let's look at the Russell. If you look at the Russell, as you can see here, um, this chart right at the beginning here is is right at the end of September and then November is like someone fired a gun. We were well underwater, over 7%, 6% underwater going into the beginning of November and then we just took off. You can see this huge rotation um, into value stocks, into cyclical stocks, out of growth stocks, traditionally technology. Remember, uh, financials are one of the largest components of the Russell 2000, believe it or not. And all of these, the higher, the, the steepening of the yield curve, all of this just moved money here. Uh, and you can see evidence of this very easily. Um, and, and I'll show you in just one minute some of the value growth ratio charts that I have here that you could run in Thinkorswim or any own charting platform. You can see that any pullback here is going to be bought. Now, for our members, one of the things I had been suggesting was TNA, uh, TNA rather, which is a, a 3x small cap bull, 
uh, and you can see here coming into the end of October a little bit of a move up uh, a higher low and then off it went I mean it just it's taken off it went from 31 up to 58 and I think it's going to run higher all right uh, there is no divergence in this any pullback is going to be bought so it's a it is a 3x uh, small cap bull uh, and you know when this it, it follows in the footsteps of the Russell but at a much more faster rapid pace okay and then finally let's look at um, transports transports here made new and I got to just adjust it here right uh, I think that high there was 225.49 uh, so it's actually a higher high right here almost made the same thing but we're at the and and this transports here that's 2020 so let me just change that to 2020 because I hate showing that on the chart uh, 20 or 2020 uh, highs right like that right and let's get that changed so if you look at the chart here um, we made 2020 highs in transports okay and then if we look at the Dow and this is the Dow futures we made the highs all-time highs in the Dow futures remember Dow theory when you have a high in transports and a high in uh, the Dow um, uh, index then that is just a very strong bull market that's that's classic bull market with Dow theory right transports typically lead the way and then the Dow follows but you can see both of them made new all-time highs so that's again why I think we still have enough even though we're getting an extension or a little bit over extension in our breadth charts for our members I'll go into more detail on the breadth charts and the charts underlying this uh, but we use these very handedly as well as the advanced decline line to take a look at when should we start to tighten our stops and look for a little bit of a pullback so that we can build up some cash take some profits and then buy again on the dip okay I'm expecting some of that but the dips gonna be a nice one in February March time frame if it lasts that long but we'll catch it before it comes down and then just to show you I'm gonna come down here to the ratio charts and I'm gonna show you right here the equal weight versus the spy and you can see here really um, since September and it really started in October uh, too because we had that little pullback but you can see this move higher in the charts you know higher lows all the way up right here and when it's moving up like this this means the equal weight spies are outperforming the spy index remember the spy index you got those four stocks five stocks Microsoft Apple Amazon Google Netflix um, uh, Facebook those guys account for um, about 23 24 percent of the spy the S&P 500 index right uh, and Tesla's going to be in it pretty soon as well um, but they account for the bulk of it well if you make every stock equal to one five hundredth uh, weighting this is what you get right here now this shows that other companies are really participating in the movement here okay very strong uh, and if we look at um, another way to look at it is growth versus value this is moving lower because growth is in the numerator so when the denominator in this ratio is outperforming the numerator it goes lower and lower so this just shows it another way but we're getting value outperforming growth right and if we come over here and look at this specialized index that I have on here that incorporates Microsoft Facebook Apple Netflix Google and Amazon look at this the last time we made new all-time highs was back on September the 2nd otherwise she's been running flat in this zone right here okay so this says yeah all the indexes are up but the fangs are underperforming you do not see this guys at a at a um, uh, when markets are topping and going lower uh, typically markets always top with a few leaders pulling the way up and when those leaders give it up the rest of the stocks don't pick up the slack they roll over even further and then you get the big down move but in this particular situation as the fangs are giving it up we're seeing value and cyclicals uh, take over so that is not a sign of a market top guys that's why you're seeing a lot of excitement going into 2021 but that's not without risk I think the risk or uh, a little bit asymmetrical right now where um, the upside is is less than 
the short-term pullback that we could see of anywhere from 5 to 15 percent. One other one that I wanted to show you just shows you the irrational exuberance that's going on. Look at high yield versus treasuries, right? Look at this chart. This is, again, a ratio chart of junk bonds, which is high yield, corporate, to treasuries. It's been going straight down. So what does that mean? How do you interpret this? What this means is that the junk bond market, the interest rates are getting so low that there's not a lot of compensation for the risk you're taking in buying a junk bond versus a treasury. Treasury, remember, that's the international standard for zero risk. I imagine at some point there will be risk in even buying a treasury at the rate they're printing money. But right now it's considered the market reference rate for zero risk trade. So everything is referenced against the 10-year U.S. treasury. And when you're comparing junk bonds in the numerator to the 10-year treasury in the denominator, and the fact that it's going down tells you that the spread between the two is very tight and getting tighter. And And when you got that out there you got big money managers going i am not compensated for the risk of buying this junk bond it's just not paying me enough interest rates or interest rates so what does that mean they start finding other areas to invest their money whether it's in emerging markets or in china or in u.s equities in dividend paying u.s equities and that's what we're seeing and that causes equity markets to run even higher okay and then of course if we come over here and we look at volatility right and we look at the VIX it's still it's in the upper boundary of the yellow zone but notice we're still in above 20 we have not gone down below and as I told our members we're gonna probably stay above 20 for another few weeks until we can get everything sorted out with the election and then going into the early part of January and we see who's gonna control the Senate remember if the Democrats control the Senate you're gonna see a little bit of a sell-off uh, the market forecast is about 72%, 73% that the Republicans are going to have at least one win out of Georgia, which means they will maintain control of the Senate. That would be from a market perspective, not from your own political ideology, but from a market perspective, that would be the best. Now you've got a divided government because Senate under Republican control will put a cap on what um, – Biden's going to be able to do and limit a lot of things out of Congress, which is now Pelosi's only got like a four vote lead and, and for her to control her entire caucus is almost impossible. So the markets just interpret that as a divided government. And typically the markets do best when you've got a do nothing uh, political uh, uh, D.C. That's what it loves the best. If we look at treasuries, if we look at the bond market, you can see here. Down a pretty good bit, right? Um, that means interest rates are up higher, and we can expect that. You can see the 50 EMA, which is serving as a huge resistance to the bond markets. So this is why I would be more apt to short the bond market instead of buying it. Or if you want to play it another way, you can play the interest rates here, interest rates moving higher, right? We're breaking out of the 200 EMA. Uh, it was using the 50 EMA as support. Now, the way to play it, obviously, if you can't do it this way, you know, in bonds, uh, you can play TLT. You could play TLT to the downside, right? Um, you could do um, uh, uh, ratio diagonals to the downside. Our members and our option masters, I show you how to do that really effectively. Um, or you can do uh, unbalanced butterflies. That's another easier way to play it for, say, beginner uh, to intermediate trader. Ratio diagonals um, and back ratios, you can get into some advanced techniques that I think work out really well longer term if you're trading interest rates moving higher on the 30-year. All right, real some interesting ways to make that play. Of course, if you look at currencies, uh, as I mentioned here, I gave you guys some freebies on the dollar. Um, and it came right down. Actually, it came down and hit right below my target. My target was right here. This is a low-hanging fruit trade, guys. Um, and I was showing our members, you know, these are just some really easy trades to pick. And obviously, you wouldn't trade the dollar index. You would trade the euro because the euro is about 58% of the entire value of the dollar index. So you'd want to trade the euro. And the euro, as I said, went right up to where I said it would go. It overextended. Uh, again, no surprise uh, from my, my perspective on that. 
uh, right up in that level, right up there. Let's see. So uh, the euro had a high of 121120. <clears throat> So and that was, was what's the high right on this one right here? Um, the high on that is one two one seven seven zero, and then uh, that high there is one two one uh, seven nine, right? So that was um, that. This to me is where we're we're going. It was just a low hanging fruit trade, guys. Uh, and you wanted to trade that with Foxtrot, X-Ray, Echo. So the currency market still looks good. Look for a little bit of a pullback and then buy the dip. I do believe the dollar here is going to be in for a near-term bounce. Okay, we're going to bounce up a little bit, but in, in, even if it comes up near the, the 50 EMA, I would be selling the hell out of that longer term, right? That's kind of where I'd be doing there on the, on the U.S. dollar. And then, of course, if we look at gold, um, a weaker dollar is traditionally solid gold. We're bouncing off a support area here, but until we can clear the 50 EMA and hold it, I would be neutral to short uh, gold. Longer term, I'm bearish uh, or bullish, but longer term or shorter term, uh, I would be using this as an area to pick up gold, really. Uh, copper, we've been bullish copper. And look at this, man. It just has not. In fact, we got bullish. Got our, I got our members bullish copper here uh, in early April. And it's just been just, you know, Katie bar the door straight up. Love it. Copper is a vote on the growth of the global economy. We had such good buy opportunity here. And obviously the way to trade is with copper futures. Many of our members did or some of our members did. And the other way to play it is Freeport Magmarin. Just a solid move higher like this. And this thing can still run. I think the next stop off point is roughly 40. It's going to have some pullbacks and some sideways actions, and there's great ways to play it, but we're still going to be long through 2021 of copper. I think it's just a really good play. And then finally, if we come down and we look at the energy markets <clears throat> and we look at gold, I'm sorry, uh, uh, oil, you can see her oil is moving up nicely here. I don't think it can go much higher, but this being held by the OPEC uh, decision, uh, they're going to gradually increase production, but not by much. So that's going to keep the supplies very tight. And remember, when you have an expanding global economy, oil, the propensity is to want to go higher, not lower. Okay. And OPEC's going to control that. And if we look at nat gas, well, nat gas just had a couple, it's going to have a hard time holding up here, right? Uh, I would be, I think longer term, nat gas is going to go down, not higher, right? So that would be what I'm looking at for nat gas. All right, everybody, that's kind of where we're sitting right now. Members, I will see you this Sunday evening. We're going to have a really interesting finish to the year. In January, February, March, Q1, there's going to be some surprises in there. Members, we're going to be ready for it. Um, and if you're not a member, I highly encourage you to come in and check us out. We're doing really well. I even have members that come back to us after they leave. They try other places, but we've got a really good track record. Our secret traders running nicely. Um, we got profits in the trades we're running there now, and we'll be putting some other ones on, and we want to take advantage of building a little bit of a cash position as I'm expecting a pullback here uh, shortly. All right, everybody, have a really great weekend. Uh, members, I'll see you this Sunday evening. Take care, folks. Ciao now.